keep it, see I'm all for keeping it. Like what's up? 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 Hello. What's the deal? I keep it real. We all leave you. I know what it is. We all leave you. Gonna get us, bitch. We all leave you. Gonna show up. Skills for real. So tell me in for advice and news. They say they not speaking like the truth. We stand up for your rights and rules. Every day is a fight. We'll fight for you. Blow the whistle. Blow the well, this whistle. is the Unleashed Voice, Unleashed Thursday, broadcasting live via Zoom and Facebook from Memphis, Tennessee. And my name is David Clemens. We got Dwayne GQ Clemens over here, host of the show today. And we have a very good show. DJ Spinderella can't get it right. Uh, man, could you please leave the music alone? Oh, we good. We good. Okay. And we have our uh, guest on today, Black police officers. They're going to introduce themselves shortly. But uh, our countries, we are in a... Um, matter of fact, this is a uproar of the people. Uh, we have a lot going on in our country and our world today, but before we get into our show, I want to bring some attention to the uh, mob beating of a transgender female in Minnesota. Her name was uh, Ayanna Dior, and apparently it was a car accident in Minnesota. The key word is accident. Accidents happen. Even the best of the drivers have accidents. Ex uh, Dale Earnhardt and all those guys on NASCAR, they have accidents all the time. But nevertheless, she had an accident. And I think she struck a pedestrian. No one was uh, uh, died on the scene or anything like that. But after the accident, I guess some of the people who were around, the civilians who were watching, um, they noticed that it was a transgender, female, black transgender. And for those of you who are watching who don't know what a transgender is, transgender in in individuals are individuals who were uh, born a certain way, but their identity on the inside identifies another way, and they go through transition to become who they are on the inside. And she was born a male, but she transitioned to a female. So she uh, had all of the outer appearance of a female, inside female, but the people knew she was a transgender. And it was a mob beating of her. They beat the shit out of her. I have the video on my Facebook page, and they were beating her, calling all, her all types of derogatory names, and it was horrible. It reminded me of a KKK mob beating um, when they used to beat us back in the day. And the store clerks, they protected her and put her in a room in the store and uh, rendered aid to her. But I was angry because uh, it happened in Minnesota where the killing of George Floyd happened. And it was our own black people who beat the black sister up. And while they were beating her, they were calling her all types of derogatory names. Uh, this damn dude, you uh, sissy, whatever, whatever. And I was angry and disappointed because our black people, we have been marching for um, against police brutality, marching for uh, against the systematic racism system that we have here in the United States, marching for equality. And then we turn around and flip the script and beat up our own people because this individual is a member of the LGBTQ plus community. And it was really sad to see that and disgusting to see that. And our people, we have to do better because we are, we get. Our own president is putting our military, sick of them on our people to make them comply. Our own president is uh, talking this game like he doesn't give a damn about anybody but himself and he's serious. But my point is, we are hurting each other. And we have to stop that and work together and live together as one in this world. And so that really bothered me this weekend. And uh, that's what's on my mind. And uh, I always have a little segment where I vent, but I vented the other day on my Facebook, so I'm not gonna vent like that. But that was on my mind that we as black people have to deal with our homophobia. 
We have a lot of trauma to deal with. We have to be repaired as a community, but we have to stick together no matter what during these times. And if it was not for these good white people out here marching with us right now, we wouldn't get this attention that we're getting right now. It's more white people marching than black people. So we need to realize that, stick together, work together, and just love on each other. And that's what's on my mind. Great way to introduce the show, uh, David. We also addressed this issue in an article that was published on the Unleashed Voice magazine page. So you can go to tuvmag.com and uh, read it. It's a disclaimer before you read it and get upset by, by what you read, but all of the details is in there. And I'll just add to this and then we can get into the show. I talked to a young lady today. Uh, she reached out to find out how she could help. Young lady, about 22, 23, and she wanted to be a part of the movement. Uh, she's not really interested in marching, but she wanted to find another way. And she's a, a graduate of University of Memphis and she's in journalism and she wants to write an article. And she said that her 87 year old great grandmother sat her down and talked to her about the women's right movement. And when the women's right movement took place, she said that as a black woman, she was pushed to the side because they said that they didn't want her talking about black women rights. It, was, it should have been women rights. And when everything came to pass, black women were still in the back because all the white women took uh, advantage of the movement and the rights. And she told her not to let this happen to anybody else that's marginalized, that's black in the community. So what she's saying that even though we have a movement going on that's been going on, but now it has really mushroomed and a lot of attention and people are eager to throw money at us and to address our equity issues and our inequality issues. You still have a subset group of the black community that's being marginalized by the white community and the black community. So this is why you see people now speaking out saying that it's time and we're gonna put it on the table. Our table is big enough to hold a lot of plates. So mm -hmm. don't say that it's not time to talk about this because it's time because it's going on right now and it's going on like disproportionately and violently to a segment of black people. So if we say all black lives matter, they have to mean we got to look out for our brothers and sisters and it's time for us as black people to address our own phobias and our own mm -hmm. isms. So it's time to address it. How you feel right now with what you saw happen to Floyd, George Floyd, it's the same way that people felt when they saw uh, Ayanna Dior being beaten in that store, that convenience store in Minnesota by that mob of black men. So we got to put our own isms and our own phobias on the table and dress them too, because what we're asking out of other people, we got to ask out of ourselves. So practice what you preach, treat people how you want to be treated, that's the golden rule. And if it's going to come around, it got to come around full circle. We can't leave nobody out of what we planning on doing and how we plan on making this move right now. And it got to be talked about. It will not be not talked about because y'all don't want to talk about it. It's going to be talked about. So we got three handsome men. Well, four. I can't, you know, four handsome men here today. Yeah. <laughs> One, he all right, but we got guests today on the Unleashed Sports <laughs> Radio Show. So we're we going to bring y'all in, and we're going to start with Mark, Mike, and Thurman to let you introduce yourself. You can give a little background if you want to, and then we're going to dive into this show tonight. Mark, you got it. Good evening, people. I'm Mark LeSure. I've been in law enforcement for 37 years. That's 10 years in the military and 27 years with the city of Memphis. I'm Mike Williams. I actually started off in law enforcement in 1978, which is actually uh, 42 years ago, believe it or not, um, in the military. And I've been on the Memphis Police Department for 21 years, and I'm currently serving as president of the Memphis Police Association, representing approximately 2,000 police officers in the city of Memphis. And I am Thurman Richardson, and uh, I have on the police department uh, in the city of Memphis uh, for about 22 years plus, and uh, love what I do. Uh, I've served in uniform patrol, 
uh, organized crime unit, uh, federal task force, uh, currently now assigned uh, to homicide bureau. And I love what I do uh, extremely. Uh, and I still have the passion for what I do. So one thing we want to talk about uh, before we begin, we are not speaking on behalf of the Memphis Police Department or any other entity. Uh, so these are individuals talking in from their individual experience as a police officer. Once again, let's throw this out there. This has nothing to do with the Memphis Police Department or any other entity that we work for. We are talking from our own individual perspective as public servants. Well, let me introduce myself. I have 18 years as a uh, police officer and I work for the city of Memphis as well. And before we begin that conversation, I, I noticed itching on uh, Mike. What do you think? What do you think about the press conference the other day? You didn't let me introduce myself. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Introduce yourself. And I'm Gwendolyn, and I work in corrections. I have 24 years. Well, actually, 34. 24 with Shelby County, and uh, so I get to deal with the individuals that you all arrest. So I get to deal with them. Now, back to your question, sir. So, uh, Reverend Mike, what do you think about the, the press conference before we start talking about our experiences as Black police officers in the South? I, well, you know, I thought the press conference was kind of interesting. Um, you know, I want to applaud the mayor for making an attempt to uh, address the issues. Uh, however, I definitely think that, you know, as a native Memphian, as a black man that has uh, marched in the civil rights movement in 1968 here in the city of Memphis, um, I, 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 I didn't feel it. I just didn't feel it, you know? I, I, it, it didn't transcend and, and touch me because I, I guess he's not familiar with you know, you took pictures with black kids on the basketball court. You did all of these things and, you know, but I still don't think you are in touch with the black community. You know, he said, well, I'm relying on these individuals that are standing here with me. Reverend, I mean, Bishop Stevenson, uh, Stevens from Golden Gate uh, Baptist Church. And it, I just didn't feel it. And then I'm going to tell you this, you know, I, I, I get all this marching and running around and all of, I get it. I believe in protest. Uh, we have, we, we've protested as police officers to bring awareness to issues that we have. Uh, so I definitely believe in protest. Mm -hmm. However, <clears throat> you know, we protested in the 60s. We tow stuff up in the 60s. Uh, we've been tearing stuff up in our neighborhoods all the way up until now and nothing has really changed, you know? Uh, I, I think it has to be something deeper. Uh, we, we have to uh, sit down with people like the mayor, state officials, and it's gonna be even harder because we have to have federal legislation as well that's really and truly going to address the systemic issues that we're facing in our communities, on our police departments and everything else. So. Uh, I applaud him for his efforts though. Mark? <laughs> you don't have to say anything. I'll I, I, I help you out if you don't have to. Wow. Uh, again, uh, I kind of agree with Mike. Uh, you're sitting here, you're, you're saying that you want to get active, you want to get involved, but you get caught <laughs> in the middle of your conversation if you're reading from a script. And that, that was my thing with it. If you want to be genuine, don't just grab the youth. I, I, I love the youth because they're fired up. They have the energy. But you need to reach every generation that's been affected. The, the youth is going to be the fire. But we need the sparks. The sparks come from the, the older people that have, have actually gone through this. And, and until you reach out into a broad spectrum of, of people, just having a young, fired up generation, I, I love it. I'm great. I'm glad that they understand their purpose. But, you know, 
anyone do speaking being, you know, I'm 54 and I'm not afraid, but I kind of caught the back end of, it, right. You know, the segregation, the busing. And I think when you're standing up and you're trying to get something going, you have to reach out to everybody, not just the younger generation. You, you have to touch everybody. Thurman? Well, uh, mine's going to be sh probably shorter than uh, you all's uh, comments, because guess what? I didn't see the press okay. conference, so I can't I can't speak on something that I didn't see. One thing okay. that I'm not uh, I'm not afraid to do, and I think this will go to a lot of our points, is that if you're not uh, well versed with something, then don't speak on it because you're speaking ignorance. And uh, whoever you are, I don't care if you are a garbage man or the congressman, people look up to you. And the, the, when you least expect it, somebody's looking at you and they're on your every word, every syllable. So I'm just gonna tell you, I didn't see the press conference. I was uh, too busy out here doing what uh, I'm asked to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And sometimes I go above and beyond like each and every one on this particular call does. And uh, we get no accolades for it. And, and that's cool. I mean, I'm, I'm cool with that because we, we knew that uh, from the onset. But uh, I passed that mic to somebody else who had the opportunity to actually view the press conference. Well, I'm gonna say this for the black preachers, not like uh, Gwen Hunter and the other piece. I was disappointed in the black preachers who were there because some of those black preachers are very conservative and they don't preach liberation for all people. But the movement is including all people. I've seen white people out there uh, protesting, Muslim, Jews, gay, straight, transgender, and you have black preachers standing there on that uh, platform who do not accept all people in their sanctuaries. They don't preach freedom and equality. The movement is about freedom and equality and police brutality. So how can you, well, I know why you did it, you want a cameo. You step up here uh, and you get in front of the camera and say, I'm with the movement. You're not with the movement because in your church, those same people that's protesting the movement, they can't even come to your church because you will send them to quote unquote hell because you don't believe in equality. So I had an issue with those, uh, I'm gonna use Rick Thompson. What do you call them black people, the black preachers? Uh, what do you call them, Mike? Uh, the Uncle Tom Negroes. I got an uh, issue with them Uncle Tom Negroes who was out there uh, uh, the other night. I won't call no names at this time, but I will call your name out. You guys are a disgrace to black preachers in this world. You want to get on camera and show yourself on camera, but you do not accept all people. And I'm saying it to, I won't call no names, but the 50% of them black preachers on that TV, you guys are a disgrace and you should have never been on that platform. And Jim, Mayor Strickland, you should have called Micah. Micah has an organization with all people, all pastors, male, female, black, white, Jew, Gentile, everybody. You should include Micah at the table, not those traditional old hanky pank Uncle Tom Negro who preach that bullish crap theology and do not accept all people. And that's my issue with the press conference. You know, can I can I pick back on that? The, okay. the, inter the interesting thing was Micah actually did a press conference earlier that day. You yes. had Jewish, uh, you had rabbis out there. You know, mm -hmm. you had uh, uh, I think uh, Spencer was out mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. uh, Gina mm -hmm. Stewart was out there. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. All of those individuals that represent, like you said, a cross section. Mm -hmm. of the city of Memphis, because I understand, you know, we, we're, we're speaking about, uh, well, actually, I'm kind of confused, but <clears throat> they're pushing the issue of uh, equality, and they're really focusing on equality for African Americans. I get it. But as you stated previously, when I look at all across the country, when I look at the protests and the marches and the this and the that, there is a large portion of uh, whites that are out there. I see Hispanics out there. I see Indians out there. I see individuals of all ethnic groups that are coming together to actually request that the government or whomever stands up and listen to the plea for equality. Go ahead. Y'all touched on, you know, a lot of, I think, important points, but David, you almost touched on it. I think you were, would handle it. Yeah, there were no women there uh, in the photo op. Oh. There were not, not, not one, not one female, black or white or Hispanic. 
No. So to mm. me, that was like um, a reality of male patriarchy system that we still trying to break through <laughs> and that you can say that there aren't <laughs> any qualified females to be wow. part of the movement. So uh you can't omit female because there was plenty of women out there margin too, young, old, black, white, out there, in, right in the fight or in the movement, even in your churches. Most of the denomination in most of the churches are females in yes. there. So yes. for the, the movement and what we have going on and what sparked the movement, we can't get tunnel vision and focus on one issue because this is not a monolithic issues. This is like an intersection of a whole lot of issues that need to be addressed. And it won't be addressed with 10 days of protest. It's gonna have to like, uh, I think Al Sharpton talked about, they marched for a whole year in the, in the 60s. The, the lockdown lasted for a 360 some days, they were at it, boycotting. I mean, marching, protesting all over the United States in the South. So we just can't go to our comfort anymore. COVID has already interrupted us with our comfort. So this here is another degree of interruption that's going to have to take place in our lives. We got to get some stuff up. You know, we're a luxury. We are a, 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 a generation of luxury. We love our luxuries. We don't have to get some stuff up because believe it or not, even though we're saying that legislation got to change and policies got to change, big corporation got to change mm -hmm. because they hold the money and the, are the biggest purporters and producers off of the black bodies, like the corporations, McDonald's. Mm -hmm. They pay the less wages, but they empl employ the most minorities and we go there and eat. So they get double dip off of us. So these are the people that got to be held to the fire. Where are you putting your money back in our community? Because they populate our community. Church is chicken everywhere. Did y'all hear church is chicken say anything? Nope. So these are the people that got to feel that, hey, this is a community that consume your products. And we need you all to invest back in us with some type of development into our community, the infrastructure. That's what those people were out there tearing up and busting buildings and robbing because they don't have access to stuff like that, not to justify anything. But there's a big divide between the have and the have-nots. And for us, fortunately, we kind of caught in the middle because I don't know what it feels like to be a one percenter up mm -hmm. there but i know what it feel like to be in the 99. <laughs> well, let's start this show let's start this show so how does it feel today in america i'll go with you thermos since you didn't give us an answer last time to be a black <laughs> police officer <laughs> in america after george floyd death after seeing the all the racist police put his knee on his neck for eight minutes and 46 <clears throat> seconds how, how does it feel i don't like that question david okay give me a question Okay, I like this question. So right. what everybody saw, they saw the police officers. And what, they, what happened for all of us in public service, it, was a, it, 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 it didn't miss none of us. So the question is, how do you feel being a subject as the cause of racial profiling, deaths, killing citizens as a police officer because when we have the uniform on and when you dress at work, that's all they see. They tend to forget that you're black. So trying to have balance in that career. How do you feel right now being labeled as a pig, uh, uh, the 12 and the kill our police and fuck the police? How do you feel, sir, Thurman? Well, let me tell you something. First of all, I feel, the, I, I feel uh, confused. <laughs> I feel... Uh, because you don't know you don't know how to respond. I'll tell you why? Because I've been I've been black for forty nine years. I've been a police <laughs> officer for, for twenty three years, almost twenty three years, and I love people all my life. So when you hear people, you know, talk the way that they do about our profession and me, and I know that I do not 
emulate uh, anything that the news uh, has been putting out there. Uh, it's disheartening. It's frustrating. It's it's not like me. And hell, I'm just as outraged. And I, and so let me go and hop on the other side. Uh, just because I wear a gun and a badge don't mean I don't feel uh, what my people feel uh, all the time, which is uh, I'm, I'm mad. I'm angry. Um, I'm disgusted. I'm scared. I'm afraid. Because, see, I didn't have this bald head uh, all the time. I, I didn't. Uh, I think y'all remember me when I had, uh, uh, some of y'all remember when I had a, 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 a short fade. Then after that, for a long time, I wore dreadlocks. I can't tell you how many times I got pulled over, uh, not just by my own, but by uh, other police departments. And trust me, I've had some some hellified encounters. Then I have friends who oftentimes come to me in frustration and uh, I have to hear that. And, and, and man, we can go on and on as it relates to how I feel about it. But man, there's so much that I can tell you about how I feel every day. Every day, I, I, it's, it's a struggle going to work. It's stressed, real stressed to, to, to actually perform this job at a, an elite level, deal with the problems that we deal with and suffer through. And you sometimes it's just, it's unbearable. And uh, I ain't asking for nobody pity, but I do uh, ask for your prayers. And that's basically how I feel in a nutshell. Yeah. Mr. Uh, Mr. Mark, do I need to repeat the question? No, ma'am. Okay. I'm pretty clear on it. Um, when I first saw the video, I, I, I was in like total, total distance. I'm like, um, through all my training, whether it was military or civilian law enforcement, all the person's handcuffed, they're, they're in control. And the next step is to get rid of the threat. You got him controlled. You put him in the back seat of the car. And if he breaks the car out, he breaks the windows out, he kicks the door loose, also just more charges to add, but everybody's safe, all of us, the officers. So from that perspective, I, I was just like totally disgusted. From a training perspective, being a training officer during a, during my career, you go, that's not in the book. That's not that's not being trained. I understand because I've done a little reading. They they have a little bit more leeway with chokeholds and restraints than we do here, but <laughs> You know, I mean, Jesus Christ, man, I don't think there, there's no training manual that says once you get him down the ground, put your hands in your pocket, which actually adds more pressure and to go on and, and stand there with, with a matter of fact, you look on your face like, hey, you know, I'm doing my job. And that's that was just to me, that was just blatant disregard for for the, the rules, blatant disregard for law enforcement. And, and we are the people that are supposed to carry the torch. We're supposed to be the ones that are enforcing the rules. We don't have to walk the line or violate the rules. You know, I, I was kind of taught early in the game, you know, sometimes you you learn there's a unique difference in control. People always get concerned with our authority. It's the power of the job you need to be concerned with because the power is great. When I can take your freedom, uh, that, that speaks volumes. Forget everything else. A, a traffic ticket, all that stuff. But when I can take your freedom because you violated the, the law, I mean, that's more powerful than any authority. And when I worked as a school officer, I would always tell my kids, you have to kind of give in and succumb to authority because eventually one day you're going to have some. And it's kind of like karma. If you don't respect the authority, when you get it, what makes you think that you're going to get it? And I would be remiss to go on to say, and, and I just had to, Today is um, June the 4th, 2020. Four years ago, my partner, Rodell Smith, was killed, was run over, blatantly murdered by an individual. But you cannot put a number on the amount of lives that Rodell saved by placing his in danger. Mm -hmm. And my question behind that is, what were the protests? Mike? You know, uh, when, I, when I saw that video, I was hurt. I was hurt to the core. You know, a lot of people try to separate 
me as a police officer from a black being a black man, being a father, being a grandfather, being a great grandfather. You, you know, uh, it's like you're the police. No. Nah. In 1968, I marched on Main Street. I remember when they came out with the dogs and the billy clubs and the water hoses. My dad had took me down there. I had a bad experience with the police in 1968 on the way home uh, from a march. I was eight years old. I was, you know, traumatized. My dad stood up that day and I was so afraid for him because uh, a motorcycle cop pulled up, talk, started talking crazy because you know, now we all from the crowd and here's this black man with his two kids. And my dad stood his ground and he just would not give up. And I was like, oh Lord, oh, come on dad. You know, kid pulling on your dad cause you have seen all of this craziness all day. Come on dad, come on dad, come on dad. Let's go dad, let's go dad. And my dad was like, no, no, I'm a man. I haven't done anything. I'm walking with my kids. What is the problem? That was the day that I decided I was going to be a police officer, but not because I wanted to have all of this power and authority. Number one, I wanted to help people. Number two, I wanted to change the system because I did not like the system. So one of the ways to change the system was from the inside. You know, you guys do what you do on the outside, but I will tell you that uh, since we have uh, become part of the police association, there have been things that have changed for the better. And it's not because of anything that I did, it's just because we have good officers here in the city of Memphis. And you know what kills me? I can tell these people out here all day long about all of the good things that these officers do on a daily basis, they give of themselves and it would not matter. I can tell you that the police department in the city of Memphis is predominantly black which uh, kind of reflects the city of Memphis, but they don't care. Because see, a lot of these people have agendas. See, I, I like being real and keeping it real. Uh, I didn't like what happened. I'm gonna tell you I don't like what happened. I've never let any police do anything to anybody illegally in front of me, wouldn't allow it or whatever, and I don't care. Because that could be my brother, my sister, my cousin, my uncle, my aunt. And guess what? I have experienced police brutality, I ain't gonna say brutality, harassment while I've been on this job as a Memphis police officer in the city of Memphis. So I'm gonna say this, I hate when people try to tell me how to be black. I hate when people try to tell me what my experiences have been. I hate when people try to tell me what I need to be doing. That's your opinion. And you're entitled to it. But I'm going to do what I do the way that I do it. And you be blessed in what you do. Question to you, Clemens. Well, when, when I saw the, the video, um, I was outraged. Uh, being a Black man growing up in South Memphis, uh, experiencing police harassment. That's why I joined uh, to be, uh, the police division to become a police officer because of the way I was treated by white, racist police as a little boy. And so I've seen racism on the inside. I've spoken up against racism on the inside. Uh, I've uh, gotten involved with uh, heated arguments of uh, uh, racism on the inside. And I was telling somebody earlier, we know who the problem kids are on the inside. Because you can walk, matter of fact, you can go to any precinct in the world and you can walk into the room, it's called roll call. And you can see how it's divided racially in the roll call. You have white officers on one side, black officers on one side. And so what I used to do when I used to go to roll call, I used to sit in the middle. Sometimes I sit on the white side just to make people mad. It's like, what you doing, Quimmins? I said, what you mean? I don't have a designated seat in here. And I did that on purpose to break it down. And one of my good partners was a white guy who grew up as a racist. He told me his dad had taught him how to be a racist. Because I asked him one time, I checked him on this. I said, why is it every time we go over into the hood, you talk crazy to people? But when we're on the other side of the precinct in the nice area, you just nice. And he was like, you know, they, they get on my nerves and blah, 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 blah. And one day he slipped up and said, nigga, on the call. Soon as he said it, I stopped him in the middle of the call. I probably was wrong. I pushed him to the side. I said, hey, I handle this call. 
and I handled the car by myself. We left and we talked about it. And he apologized, but he said his dad had taught him how to use them words. And my point is, I said something. Like Mike said, you can't take away my blackness by being a police officer. I stand up for what's right. And hell, I even sued the police department. And I'm still working for them. So all I'm saying is, I'm with the protest 100%. If I could walk now, I'd be at that protest. If I just had surgery, I can't walk. But I believe in I believe in protest. I believe in your First Amendment right. But I just believe that don't try to attack me for being a part of the, the problem. The problem is bigger than us. This is a systematic issue. This is not a local issue. This is a systematic issue. And so we have a lot to do. And so I just have an issue when people try to question my blackness by being a, a police officer uh, uh, and, and fighting against injustices. So... That's my so take on it. One of the questions that came through Facebook from Reverend Floridia Jackson says that the, the uprising was about police brutality. That in the nation, the United States, that we have a problem with police brutality. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest movements that started Black Lives Matter was when uh, I believe Trayvon or Mike Brown, it was one of them, was killed mm -hmm. by the police on uh -uh, black men. And uh, CNN did a really good special where they just show picture after picture after picture of mm -hmm. the officers coming up um, and this being the end result of the encounter. Do y'all think that we got a problem in the United States with police brutality of killing unarmed black men? Uh, we can go back the same way. Thurman, Mark, Mike. Hell yeah, it's a problem. Shit, we wouldn't be sitting here today if it wasn't a problem. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm just gonna keep it 100. Let me tell you something. Don't people instill a lot of trust in us? And we got to do our job. Uh, they train us well. Uh, I know they did when I came through the academy. We did a lot of things that was uh, routine, and uh, so that we could actually get used to actually getting a lot of flack, but we still have to maintain our cool and calmness about ourselves so that we will not uh, overreach our boundaries and, and be put in, put in that category as using excessive uh, force. There mm -hmm. shouldn't be one person, not one person mm -hmm. should die while in mm -hmm. our care and custody, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. today, tomorrow or today is George Floyd. Tomorrow, yeah. it, could be, it could be my brother, it could be my son, it could be y'all's yeah. son, y'all's uh, kin folks. And yeah. it, it, so you, you daggum right, it's a problem. now. You know, again, what happened in Minneapolis, Minnesota was a tragedy. Mm -hmm. I stand uh, against it. Uh, and if anybody knows me, my record when it comes to identifying problems in our police department from a criminal aspect, uh, I'm going to lock your ass up. I don't, care if, I don't care if you wear a gun or a badge. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. Period. Okay, we ain't, it's not for discussion. You can you can check my uh, my arrest history as it relates to people who I locked up. Unfortunately, I had to lock up people that not only uh, uh, made the same oath that I did, mm -hmm. but shit, I ro I roll with. All mm -hmm. right, we work too hard to make this profession uh, uh, a very moral and uh, upstanding profession for us mm -hmm. to allow and stand idly by and watch a few select individuals tear down. Yeah. So hopefully I covered your question. Uh, sometimes I get off on my tangent and I just go all the way in left field. So I'm gonna pass oh. that mic to somebody else and let you them did. talk. Come on, Mark, get you some. Um, I'm gonna start in 1972. Uh, grew up in South Memphis and my uncle uh, stayed in trouble. And uh, he had this thing about running from the police. And I remember about six or seven years old, the police kicked the door in and just like literally just nightstick, billy clubs, whatever you want to call it, but just literally beat my uncle right there in my presence. And this is, I'm six years old. Yes, brutality has always been a problem. It's always going to be a problem if we don't address the issues and like Evan said earlier, it just doesn't start when a person joins the police department. Mm -hmm. It has been ingrained in them. It's been yeah. buried in them. Just like African-Americans, we are taught 
be respectful, have some integrity, and do what's right. My mother taught me at an early age, if you do right, right's going to follow you. If you do wrong, it's going to catch up with you. I believe that. And, and being, a, being a police officer and trying to enforce those rules, man, I'm not above the law, but I'm going to enforce it. And brutality, there's no excuse for it. If you are in a situation where you become overwhelmed because the individual that you're about to arrest has pissed you off, that's why you have a radio. That's why you call for backup. But if you had a damn good partner, your partner would go, all right, that's enough, bro. Let me get it. Let me handle it. That's how you avoid those kinds of things. But what's ingrained, and, and I'll give you a little, little kind of get off a little bit, but the other day, Thurman and I, I work in homicide as well. Thurman and I was out on a scene, and one of our, one of our male white counterparts was with us. And we were sitting at the bus stop. And I looked up at him and I said, hey, uh, have you ever sat at a bus stop? And me and Thurman started laughing, saying, man, I remember I used to catch the, the, the 29 this, and I had to get a, a pass over to this. And he said, no, oh, I, 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 I never had to catch a bus. So again, it comes back to policing. You can't police what you don't understand. If, mm -hmm. you, if you had never had your lights turned off, you can't understand how it is in the hood. If you miss a me, meal. Let me interject in there real quick. Because I don't want people to, to get it twisted. Just because you had the experience, what me and Mark and, and Davin, Twin and, and Mike has experienced, don't mean you're in it less or more than what we are. Just you had an experience. There's some things that I had an experience that my counterparts have an experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, let me tell you where the rubber meets the road. We have to start all of this, uh, this healing by having a conversation. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, racism is, is perpetuated and is fueled because we want to stay in, in a state of ignorance. All you got to do sometimes, I say sometimes, all you got to do is just strike up a, of a, a conversation. And I guarantee you, five to 10 minutes in the conversation, people on both sides, black and white, uh, and any other uh, race represented, will find out, I hurt like you, I love like you, I bleed like you. Mm -hmm. we, have more in, we have more in common than we do differences. Yeah. So with that being said, just to kind of qualify what Mark was saying is this, you know, just because there are obvious differences and subliminal differences does not mean we cannot grow together as one and I guarantee you, inside the police department, if we talked and we loved on one another, I guarantee you that crap that went on in Minneapolis, Florida, New York, uh, uh, sometimes here, would not go on because mm -hmm. we would love one another. And we could say, hey, if I do this, that's just like me, if me being, if me being white. And I know Mark, and I got to know Mark, and I see that somebody black has chastise me, maybe love will overtake me and say, hey, look, I can't do that because I know uh, just because he's black don't mean he's a bad person. I'm, I'm, pol I'm policing right next to a black person. So let me let me proceed with due care and love. Mm -hmm. Hey, Mark, it wasn't called a pass. It was called a transfer. I actually catched the 13 bow and shower when I was a little boy. <laughs> well, I, I, you gotta keep it Mm -hmm. um, keep in mind, man, I'm a little older now. I understand, so, I understand, I understand. Oh, and, and, you know, I, I ain't had to get a transfer or, or I ain't had to have a bus pass. You know, they gave it to us when I was a kid. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it was, it was a, it was right, a transfer. So when did, when did hey, they start having a... Uh, Chris Cross had outside, I missed the bus. Yeah. Boy, gave your theme song because he hated catching that bus. <laughs> but, but, it, but doing things like that... Had, I didn't know they had bus passes for uh, a dog and pony carriages then. <laughs> uh, Reverend Mike, your turn. <laughs> no, I think Mark was going to say something else. Yeah, he oh, yeah. was going to say something, but I thought you going to put that middle finger up at me for saying that. But, but go oh, ahead, Mark. I, I, I'll get you at work. But again, to, to say with the brutality there, yeah, it, it's, it's there. And, mm -hmm. and it, it, uh, it needs to be addressed. And you, you do address it by not, when it happens, not just saying, oh, that's just an isolated incident. Because like like I wanted the guys said earlier, nine, nine times out of ten, 
when a guy is getting complained on and you just constantly sweeping it under the rug, it's just a matter of time before he does something to embarrass the entire group. Mm. And, and, and also from another perspective, I've been terminated from the job. Yeah. yeah. Fired. I fought like a dog to prove that I was innocent. And the worst thing in the world, but it, through all the adversity I had faced through that, it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And this is the reason why. The worst feeling in the world is to be telling the truth and nobody listens. Mm. And that's one thing police officers will do. Mm. We need to listen more. Because mm. sometimes we get so heated up and so rolling into the feeling, a person could be telling us the truth and we don't even listen. And I'm mm -hmm. telling you, that is the worst feeling in the world to know you're telling the truth. And it's even worse when you're a police officer and your peers are not even listening because mm -hmm. they have to get you. And then mm -hmm. you have to prove yourself until one day I woke up and said, you know what? Mm -hmm. I don't have anything to prove to anyone. All I have to do is keep some integrity, do the job I love, and the citizens will understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Come Reverend? on, Brother Williams. Well, quite naturally, police brutality has exist. It, it exists now. And if law enforcement remains, it's going to exist in the future. You know, you, you can't get into a person's mind. I know they try to do everything they can to filter out uh, with psychological tests and all of this. You know, but the way things are going right now, and I'm not trying to deflect or anything like that. You got a lot of, and, and you have a lot of these officers that are operating in a combat zone uh, on a daily basis. Because even during the march, you know, I just looked at a video uh, that I had seen where uh, we had three police officers shot at. You've had so many officers injured all over the country. But even prior to the protest, you know, we're the second, third most violent city in the nation. We answer almost a million calls a year. And that's why I keep saying, I get it. I see what happened in Minnesota, but it didn't happen here. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Uh, at the rapid pace that we keep. You know, you look at these two guys, Mark and Thurman, working homicides. Man, these guys stay busy in this city. Matter of fact, they roping and stomping and trying to keep up. You know what I mean? So we have a lot of damaged people that are working for the police department in this city. Mm -hmm. we, I don't care what nobody say. I say it all the time. I say it to the command staff. I say it to HR. You know, we fought to get some psychological programs, uh, free psychological counseling, you know, for mm -hmm. officers in this city because I've been in real combat, uh, you know, in the war. And I tell people, you know, even when you're in the war, they allow you the ability to come back to the rear. They keep you in there for only so long because they know after a while you have no self-control because now all you're doing is tra being trained to kill because you're hypervigilant. Your endorphins are always on point, you know? Well, guess what? These officers out here riding in these streets, man, they ride, we got guys that's been in a patrol car for 20 years, 21 years, 22, 23 years. And I'm telling you, the call loads have increased. We went from 2,515 officers down to 1,900 officers. So they're answering more calls and they're, and, and the police department, don't get me wrong, they don't care. They're, look, uh, how many tickets you write? Uh, 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 what's on your call long? Uh, 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 you need to get back out there. Get in service. Uh, 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 647, 647. Uh, you in service? No, I'm not in service. I'm trying to pee. You need to get back in service. Oh, okay. So now you're chasing people and you have to have, like what Mark said, individuals that will reel you in. Because see, when you get out there, you get to chasing, man, Jesus Christ. These folks shoot at you now. They shooting AKs, they shooting SKSs, they shooting Mac 11s. They got 75 round drums, they got 100 round drums. Guess what, people? A lot of these police officers are afraid because you got what's going on now, and then you got the police department saying, don't be overly aggressive. 
Don't be overly aggressive. But see, you could get the police killed like that too because they're going into situations where individuals have guns and guess what? As you see some of these videos out here, these young people are not afraid to use these guns. And if you hesitate, it could go one way or the other. So does police brutality exist? Yes, it does. And you're gonna have to do things to be able to correct that. Uh, I agree with everyone else. Police brutality exists. We have to do a better job at uh, being, like Mike, uh, like Mark said, being culturally sensitive to uh, the cultures that we deal with. Uh, we could increase the curriculum that we're being taught. Uh, we could do a better job on, I don't know, we don't keep data on racism within the police department. I don't, I don't know anything about any data that's being kept. Somebody asked that question. I don't think we keep any data, but uh, that wow. would be, that would be, yeah, that'd be crazy to keep up with data of racist officers. Uh, could, could you have enough people on staff? Hello. Uh, <laughs> so uh, also I have, and I'm pretty sure they have, we have spoken up when we seen racism yeah. on the police department. Uh, it exists. Matter of fact, we had a group of black officers sue the police department because of racist practices on tests. So it exists. And so I don't think you have officers out here. I don't, I can't speak for the guys in Minnesota because if I was in that situation and the guy was in handcuffs, I'm like, Mark, the fight's over with. Get off the guy. If he resisted, let's hold him down another way, get him up, put him in the car, whatever. But eight minutes, 46 seconds is too long. But as far as me, I will speak up. Uh, I would want people to pull my call if I get out of control. We could do a better job on uh, training, uh, dealing with our community. And so it's a lot of improvement we can do, but I think it's improvement on both sides. The community can do a better job on police relations. The police can do a better job on a community relation because it's a hard job to have right now. This right here has changed the game. That's a good thing. But we all can do a better job uh, working with each other. And I don't know how you'll keep data on racist police. Somebody asked that question, that'll be kind of hard, but uh, but it, it is an issue in police work. So my next question, um, and this is gonna require each of you to do a little uh, introspection. So how do you think, I, okay, let me, let me tell you, let me bag up. I remember uh, when Davian was little, and, uh, and he wanted to be a police officer since he was like six years old. He knew at that age what he wanted to do. And um, I was always in law enforcement since 84. And people used to love the police. You know, it was like an occupation that kids aspired to be firemen. I want to be a police officer. I want to be a teacher. You know, I'm gonna be a doctor, I'm gonna be a lawyer. So those like the common things that we saw because I didn't have people in my family that nobody had even graduated college yet, right? My nephew was the first one to graduate college. So you didn't have these lofty dreams, you know, being an owner of a store unless it's in the hood. What happened that shift the mind to all of a sudden in the South to make the police the enemy. I kind of remember a little bit when NWA came out and they had the song, Fuck the Police, because what was going on in LA. But when, the, 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 when, the, when, when everything came to the surface with the Rodney King, that exposed the corruption and the racism that was going on in LA, which we know about. We know that it existed in California, but in our area, outside of Mississippi, let's say Memphis, Tennessee, we're going to stay home. It just, all of a sudden, it's like the enemy now. And I know, and you all know, that a world without law and order would be a world people don't want to see. They think they want to see it, but they don't want to see it. Because when you need help, who coming? The vigilantes coming then. It's going to be like you got to pay the mob to protect you. So, what do y'all think, just personally, we ain't even talking about police, we just talking about as black men. What happened to make all of a sudden this the enemy be between the citizens and the police outside of just saying the, the killings? Because now it's almost as if they talking about, they want to disband the police department. Yep, yep. 
You know, I was like, huh? Say what? You gonna do who? You gonna disband the police department and then start over with some community police? Not to say that you don't need the, um, the level of degrees of violence and brutality or whatever, but the governance from people not going out and just kicking your front door in in broad daylight without worrying about getting arrested. Because that's what gonna happen. We saw that in broad daylight on Madison, in Madison Square Garden in New York the other day. No fear, no repercussion, nothing. Just jumping, grabbing, taking whatever they want. And that's like a bro a normal day when we disband the police. Who's, who's going to be out governing the community? Who's going to be out protecting? So what's the question? What happened uh, to uh, make uh, it become such a big divide between the police and the community? People hate the police. Oh, um, hell, I'll jump in. Uh, I'll go ahead, jump. All right, I'll jump on that one. I, I think it, like you said, I think it goes a little further back when, if, when you're looking at, and I, I'll use the term black community because I, I grew up in, in, the, in the hood, so-called hood. But when we started kind of tearing at the core of our nuclear black families, when mm -hmm. fathers, that I think to me, that's the beginning. Because now a lot of kids are, are being raised in families without fathers without positive male role models. And, and then you, you have to look at it from the perspective of when we were growing up, like you said, uh, G, we were told the police, you know, if you get it, if you're having a problem, you get lost, you go to the police. Now, if you're a police officer, you're in a uniform, you're in a store, the first thing you hear parents say, if you do something wrong, the police gonna get you. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're making, you're putting these kids in a situation where they're choosing between do I go to this person or do I, because if I go to the police, they're going to lock me up. But this is what I try to tell parents families, be careful about that because if a kid's afraid to come to the police and they're having a problem, they choose to go to someone else. What if that person's a molester? What if that person's a rapist? What if that person's a killer? We're putting our kids in situations where they're having to choose and then what if they choose wrong? So I yeah. think that that's and and that's just my perspective. That's just the basic beginning of where I think it started. I uh, could be wrong. There's no data to support it, but you know, just through experiences. And I'm fortunate. I'm blessed. My mom and dad are still alive, and they're still together. But you know, my dad worked a lot, and I didn't care. My dad came in at twelve o'clock at night. If you didn't wash the dishes or the grass won't cut. <laughs> your ass is going to be out there in the yard with a flashlight because then he's going to get up <laughs> the next morning and say the line's not if the line not straight you're going to cut him again before you go to school and when, and when you don't have that kind of discipline and order within a household you can now hear it, and nowadays our kids are growing up technology technology you know I, I got a I got grandkids my five year old grandkid told me this morning uh, Papa, the reason why this is not coming up because you didn't push this button. She's fine. She's telling me about a cell phone because I forgot to push a button. Because she's watching and paying attention. So we're, we're focused more on technology than morals. We need to start with morals. I think the morals are what's missing in our society, my opinion. Uh, I think a lot of it also has to do with a shifting in society. Uh, especially when crack hit the scene. A lot of things started happening and it was definitely hitting the black community really hard. And in doing that, you had, I know we talk about black fathers, but I'm gonna tell you, we even had black mothers that were abandoning their kids. And then it was relegated to the grandparents to actually raise kids. So the grandparents are a little bit older and they're not going to have all of that energy that a regular parent would to stay on that kid. But then on the flip side, you had mothers who were on drugs who mm -hmm. were bringing men into the household and putting them in the bed with their daughters. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, it just went all crazy. Then we started glorifying crime. Mm -hmm. Then it went from R&B love songs and all of that to rap, mm -hmm. you know? And it was cool with Kumo D and all of them, but then we went to, you know, shoot a person, kill a person. Uh, I'm a rider. We talk about the trap house. We talk about this. We talking about that. They glorifying murder. So now you got these young kids that are growing up and they think that this is the way. See, when we came up, you had to go to church. You had to do this. You had to do that. There was mechanism put in place. Like Mark said, you had to work regardless of what it was. You had uh, chores in the house that had to be done. You know, mm -hmm. I see in a lot of households now, I'm not saying all people, so don't get upset. If this don't apply to you, then it don't apply to you. But I'm going to tell you a lot of the houses that I went into and mm -hmm. when I was on uniform patrol, it was nasty, uh, trash everywhere, no organization, kids, mm -hmm. uh, kids, I'm locking kids up and they like, Officer Williams, Officer Williams, you don't understand, baby, what I don't understand. Uh, I'm trying to take care of my little brother, my little sister. We ain't got no food in the refrigerator. Where your mama? Man, she out there on them drugs. Where your daddy? He locked up. So you got kids raising themselves. Mm -hmm. And not only that, I'm going to say this. We have failed them. We failed them. My generation failed these kids because we got eight black people on the city council. And I ain't trying to make this a black and white thing, but I'm talking about the black community and these young black kids. We got eight black people on the, on the city council. They can move city hall. But guess what? They're not putting money back into their communities. They're not ensuring that a lot of the budget is going back into the community for literacy programs, for uh, we gave up our school system. The, the, the most important thing when we came up that we knew that if we achieved, we could actually succeed the educational system. We gave it up and gave control to the county mm -hmm. because they said it was gonna cost an extra, extra $56 million. And under a, under a black mayor. <laughs> exactly. So I'm saying we failed them. We don't have a lost generation. We have a left generation. But we, my generation, we went to Wake Forest and Xavier and Spelman and Howard and Morris Brown and Clark and uh, Tennessee State, Mississippi State. We went to all of these prestigious schools. And then you come back. Now you want to assimilate and be a part of the system and you disassociate from the community. Mm -hmm. You won't go back. You won't be that bridge. And then mm -hmm. guess what? We leaving them out there to fend for themselves. And then we wonder what the problem is. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Oh, it's a different world. Come on, Dave. Well, I think people hate the police. Um, because of um, we got racism, we have these uh, sensitive issues on both sides that we do not talk about. Race matters in America, so it doesn't. You don't change uh, being a racist by putting a badge on. It may increase your racism when you get a badge and a gun. So just don't just don't think because someone becomes a police, their racism goes away. No, 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 no. We have homophobic police, racist police, sexist police all the above. So it's a lot of sensitive subjects and issues that we have to deal with in America. Uh, and I think that's what, you know, make people hate the police. Um, and it's work that we can do. I don't mind. I'm a, I, now, they need to give me credit for this. They should let the, some of the community <laughs> activists come in and help teach the culture sensitivity. I don't have an issue with that. Come on in and let's talk. We go to you, you talk, you come to us, let's talk. But it's like this song Will Smith wrote, parents just don't understand. And so you have a lot of police who don't understand, a lot of community activists who don't understand. But police brutality is a thing in America. It's an issue. People hate the police. Matter of fact, I hate the police in certain states. I got pulled over in Illinois. I hate the Illinois State Trooper. White man pulled me over. We was going to a wedding. And he asked me for my license, insurance, registration. I gave it to him. I'm sitting in the car. I was in uh, my expedition. My first bought me an expedition, brand new expedition. Young black guy, family in the car. It's about a caravan, about four of us. And he says to me, step out the vehicle. And I said, I know my lights are good. I said, uh, sir, is it a reason why? Step out the vehicle. 
I said, sir, would it make a difference? I told you I was a, a police officer and blah, 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 city and state. I gave my ID. He looked at it. Step out the car. I said, I, I'm mad. I think my mama, were you in the car with me? She was I was, I was, um, I was behind you. Oh, so you, it was your sister in the car. It was like, calm down, calm down. Come step out. So I'm hot. So I step out the car. He walking, he's walking behind me. I'm like, where am I going? He's like, to my car. I said, for what? I said, dude, I gave you my license, my registration, and my insurance. I got good license, good insurance, good registration. He opens up his passenger door. Oh, redneck in Illinois. I hate y'all state troops in Illinois. He opened up his door and he said, sit down. I'm hot. I sit down. This joker pulls his ticket book out and wrote me a courtesy citation. He said, slow down in my state. No. He sits me down here on the radio, runs my driver license right in front of me. And I'm hot. I ain't saying nothing. He puts his ticket book out, wrote me a courtesy citation. He told me, slow down in my state. I looked at him, I signed, I got his car, and I was frustrated, I was angry. But I saw he was racist. He was he did that because I told him about where I work. I gave him my ID. He wanted to humiliate me in front of my family. It was no need to pull me out the car. If you're gonna write me a ticket, leave me in the car. But my point is this, that's why people hate the police, shit like that. And so we have to realize that we can't do stuff like that. Uh, you know, uh, hey, look, I'm guilty. I've done asshole and stuff like that before being an asshole. I've done it before. But we, 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 we have to realize the times we're in now are very sensitive. People are traumatized, people are hurt, and we can't do little petty stuff like that. And that's why people hate the police. Go ahead, Thurman. So we know that Thurman didn't get his in. Yes, he did. No, I didn't. Oh, okay, come he on. Didn't, he didn't Don't get... worry about it. I'm just, I'm singing my song. I'm just a nobody. <laughs> anyway, no, 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 no. Real you get this one right here. So we know that that the, the military. You still ain't going to let me get in. That's how I go to the next Let me get his question. I got you. I got you, Thurman. This is even a better one. So okay, we, know, I... we know that we know that we have extremists. Uh, we know we have racist groups that's infiltrating the military, uh, using the training, coming back out, taking that back into the communities. And we also know that they infiltrate in the police department because that's a least legal license to discriminate. And so far, it's been a legal license to kill. So we, yeah, yeah, because there haven't been too many killings of unarmed black or white people and the police were found guilty. Even in Minnesota, which has a history of this, the guy that killed Fidelo Castro got off and it was on Facebook Live. So even Tamir Rice, even with Eric Gardner, those police officers got off. So very, it's very rare, rare that they win a conviction in the court. That's what a lot of people are really afraid now that this is not gonna um, pan out the way they want it to pan out. So my question is, back to the original statement that we have individuals in, infiltrating the police department. So what I want the people to know and listen that there are bad actors in every occupation. There are bad actors in corrections. There are bad actors teaching school. There are bad physicians. There are bad uh, dentists, they're bad uh, people. When I used to work at the food stamp office, I hate And when I used to go get food stamps, I hated going to get food stamps. That was the worst place to go to go pick your food stamps up. And I thank God I went on them long, but I sure had some. They were rude. They were awful in, in serving the community. So there are bad actors and actresses in every occupation in the world. Just like you said earlier, you talked about the 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 um the preachers, right? That's supposed to be the safe place that we go to church. But you know, you got people that's in their position that's not in there for the good of the people. And that's what we want people to know. We want to know: do you think that we're gonna reach a point of healing and reconciliation for our community between the community and the police department? And the question was, how do we get there? First of all, uh, hopefully one day we will. I can't say that because hell, it's been 14, I mean, 400 years and we've been 
uh, fighting this battle for a long time. And he's still you, know, you know why I, we've been fighting for all so, the years? Well, and I'm about to get there. So check this out. We have to work together. And when I say we, I'm talking about uh, those individuals that are being oppressed and we can't be scared, you know? Trust mm -hmm. me, even at the end of this particular Zoom, I guarantee mm -hmm. you we're gonna have a, a backlash for just uh, telling the, the flat foot truth. A mm -hmm. lot of times we have so much loyalty to a profession uh, or to others and, and we don't wanna rock the boat and Ooh. the boat been rocked a long time ago. So mm -hmm. that's one thing that has Our to be notion. done in order for us to get to where we need to be. We got to rock the boat and look, uh, I think anybody that knows me that's, that's uh, maybe watching, not watching, or probably will, will will view this later on, know that I got great friends, white, black, uh, Asian, uh, Indian, uh, Chinese. I got midget friends, you know, and <laughs> let, let me tell you something. It's they, little people. Midgets. Uh, anyway, no, I'm just messing with you because I am sensitive. I am sensitive. But uh, they know I love them. So check this out. We have to uh, change mm -hmm. and we can't we got to change the hearts and the minds in order for mm -hmm. us to get where we are uh, a lot of us like to talk about it. Mm -hmm. this is the, this is the scary part right here y'all listen to this now mm -hmm. four or five weeks from now will we still feel the same way we feel now will we it's gonna blow away uh some some other issues gonna come up they probably have COVID-20 by then. And we're going to forget all about this injustice and then going back to business as usual. We can't. We just cannot mm -hmm. do it. You know, mm -hmm. the definition of insanity is to just keep on doing the same thing and you expect different results. And it's mm -hmm. been insane for quite some time. Yes. Um, we have to talk. We have to yeah. identify the problem, what we're doing here. As a matter of fact, early on in this particular dialogue, there were some suggestions as it relates to uh, the, how we would go about solving some of the problems. Um, mm -hmm. When you see that there are problem actors in your work field, you got to address that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in the federal government and what's going on, I don't, I'm not going to get into politics, uh, but just to do a, a, a parallel, they have what they call whistleblowers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if people will blow the whistle, mm -hmm. and when they blow the whistle to that in a confidential way, and mm -hmm. They look into it, all right? And they sit back and observe and then address it. Now we got some, we got some, we got some traction. But it has yes. to be done in that particular way. You know, me, yeah. I've been to police a long time. I don't believe anything mm -hmm. anybody tell me. So when you take it to me, I just sit back, I watch it. If I see it and I know that it's true now, and mm -hmm. I hate it, it's incumbent upon me in order to uh, react. And, yeah. and and do something about it. We have to do that. That's how we're gonna change this, this thing. It's got to yeah. be uh, a sweeping reform uh, when it yeah. comes to racism and in our uh, department here. Not just in our department, man. Just I'm talking about all over. You know, mm -hmm. and man, I, I'm, I I get so emotional when it comes to that because I had the best of both worlds. Went to uh, uh, Fairley Elementary, which was at that time uh, we had. It was a predominantly black school. Then mm -hmm. I went to South Haven, which was a predominantly white school at the time. And then I went to an HBCU in college. And then I come into the to, to the work field and I've actually experienced, you know, both races. Um, and I've, I've got great friends and I know they're good and bad actors on, on both sides of the field, black and, and white. So uh, to take a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King, that's the reason why I judge people, not by the color of the skin, but the content of their character. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the principle that if we, uh, if we adopt that in every police department uh, and we truly make an honest effort in doing so, uh, this will uh, be a good step, a good foot forward when it comes to combating racism. Judging people on the content of the character, not their color, not the differences. You know, come on, y'all. This 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 time out for that. Mm -hmm. Come on, Mark. Will we ever get there? Yeah, and uh, well, kind of like Thurman. I I grew up in, in in Westwood. When we moved there in '71, there were not a lot of black families there. But by the time I became a senior in high school, it's predominantly black. 
but the training never exists. And, and I'll give it to you this way. And even in the military, I spent 10 years there. And my last name is LaShure. And as a military police investigator, you have a skill identifier. So when you get ready to move from one duty station to another, that's the first thing they're going to look at. And they mm -hmm. would look at that. And I had the identifier with Victor Five. That meant I was an investigator. Mm -hmm. So I would get this big welcome packet saying, welcome to Fort Hoochie Coochie. Uh, and we're going to welcome you. you you'll be assigned to the uh, criminal investigative detachment when you get here. And then when I get there and they see the face, the face didn't match with the last name because they thought I may be some Italian guy or, or some French guy. And they, were like, they were like, oh, that, that position's been filled. So, <laughs> yeah, Mike's laughing. Mike knows. I mean, so so this thing's deeply rooted. It's just not yeah. It's not in our society. It's the military as well. And mm -hmm. you always, you're always put in positions in the military as well as out here. You mm -hmm. always put in a position that you always have to prove yourself. Does, doesn't my character prove who I am? Yeah. What I stand for, doesn't mm -hmm. that prove who I am? What I believe in, doesn't that prove who I am? We're constantly questioned about who we are. Mm -hmm. We know who we are and we know whose we are. But it's going to exist as long as we don't address the issue. When when something happens and a, and, and a male black is the topic of discussion, we need swift action. Mm -hmm. But when it's one of our counterparts, well, maybe he made a mistake. We, we won't, you know, let's look at it differently. And, and that's where the problem starts. Mm -hmm. and, and until we start addressing the, the problem inwardly, yeah, within the system, yeah. It's never, we never can come out here and do anything positive with the community if the problem reside, resides within. You have mm -hmm. to address what's inward because if I'm, my heart is not good and when I'm talking to you, you know how kids always say real talk? Yeah. We know real talk when we hear some real <laughs> BS. Period. And that's the key to this job <laughs> as a black police officer. My word has to mean something. Yeah. It, it, if I tell a child they're hungry, I'm going to feed you, I mm -hmm. have to feed them. Mm -hmm. If I tell a child, here's my phone number. If you're in trouble, you call me. If that kid calls at two o'clock in the morning, you've got to answer the call. You've got to because they are depending on our word. And mm -hmm. I'm big on the integrity. You know, I, I, I will be honest, I, I'm very candid. I'm not a, afraid to express myself, but mm -hmm. one thing nobody can ever question is my heart. Mm -hmm. If you do this job with heart and compassion, mm -hmm. be fair, firm, and consistent, mm -hmm. that's how you get the, the community to love you. Because I was a school officer. When I moved into that neighborhood, the, the people were filing petition. They were going to the school board. They were going to the department. This guy's crazy. <laughs> We want him out of our neighborhood. But I understood the job. The purpose for me to be there was to change the mindset. Yeah. I had to change the mindset. I don't like nobody. I'm going to lock up everybody. I'm locking up the principal, the teachers, the kids, the community. But once I got the kids to understand what I was really there for, mm -hmm. guess what the kids start preaching to their parents? He's not what? a bad guy. He cares about me. Mm -hmm. He cares. And I think we've gotten away from the caring part. Locking them up is the easy part. Talking it to them and convincing them to do the right thing, that's the best part of our job. And we've lost that art. It's much mm -hmm. easier to get on the on the loudspeaker and say, get off the corner, instead of getting off, get out of the car and engaging them. They're, they're a little bit more dangerous. But if you open up and try to meet them in the middle, we have to try to bridge the gap. And that with us being in the neighborhood and the community all the time, we're an important boat to the bridge. Yeah. And if we don't start looking at it that way, we're fighting a losing battle. As police officers, we have a great community service 
uh, uh, unit here in this city. But they they found out what it is. Kids are, are angry and hostile because of mm -hmm. naive. Feed them. And sometimes it's just not about the food. You got to feed them knowledge too. You know, and, and rest of, I use a few biblical words and I'll get out my box. But the main thing I, I wanted to enforce and emphasize when I worked in the schools was restoration. Everybody always says, dog, oh, I worked at Trez. Trez is a bad school. The school has been there since the first lit brick was laid. It's not the school, it's what comes in. It. And until I change the mindset of what's coming in it, we cannot change what goes out. That's why I'll stop. Reverend? I don't think we're ever going to get there. Uh, totally. I think we have to work toward trying to get as close as we can. You can't change people. You can't, you can't go into the hearts and minds of people. You know, you're not with them when they're born. So when you talk about racism, uh, it's going to always be among us. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think that we have to also, and people hate when I start talking like this, we got to take responsibility in our own community for a lot of things that are happening to us. We got to take responsibility for the rearing and raising of our lineage. We have to take responsibility and <clears throat> we have to protect them, you know, uh, in trying to put forth legislation and trying to push our elected officials to do the, the job that we elected them to do. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to change things, it means you have to do something. And yeah. that means not just the five people that are sitting here talking, not just the police department, not just uh, certain individuals within the community, but we have to get back to trying to engage the community as a whole and move the community forward. Because if we keep leaving people behind and we keep being segmented, then we're going to always be faced with the problem of individuals exposing themselves. I go back to my father in 1968, you know, mm -hmm. when we didn't have as many rights and we didn't have as much stuff. But guess what? Those folks stood their ground back then. And they stood their ground because they didn't do it for themselves. Most of our parents or grandparents lived in poverty. But they gave everything they had and pushed us to be educated, to be better. We need to be pushing our young people to be better than us to move forward. Why? Because you can sit there and say what the hell you want to say to me. But see, you would never take my integrity. My life you may take, but my integrity never, never. And I'm going to carry myself in a certain way. You ain't got to... Uh, Respect me? No, that ain't it. You ain't gotta like something. Like you. you ain't you gotta, gotta like me. You, you ain't yeah. gotta like me, but oh, you gonna respect me because I'm a demand respect. You understand Hello. what I'm saying? Because I'm a Hello. man. Hello. So to wrap it up, Gwen, I don't think we're ever gonna get there. I think we have to keep striving to be the best and to do put our position ourselves as best as we can. Yes. Well, I think we're at a pivotal mo moment in our country right now. Uh, I, I believe that uh, God allow, I believe in God, God allows things to happen. God has allowed number 45 to do what he do and expose a lot of things. If he was not in the position to expose all this stuff that's going on, we wouldn't be here today. And he has uh, ignited a fire in racism. He's ignited a, a, a fire in classism. He's ignited these fires, but they've been here. He's just exposed the system. And so uh, we got comfortable with President Obama was in office and now we're uncomfortable. And he said it yesterday, make them in power feel uncomfortable. And I think right now with these group of young people, I think they have a little more fire than our people in the sixties had coming up because of the privilege they have now with social media, with this right here, with their uh, books and education. So I do think we may get there if we got it right here. They got it right here. If we get the right people behind the young folks to push it, 
we can we can get that. We 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 got some, Mike. We we got some working for us because I'm gonna tell you why, Mike. We're pushing it right now. We don't have a clear leader. Who's our leader? It's mm-hmm. showing the hell like Al Sharpton. You're not gonna get, you're not gonna get there, Davin. I'm telling you. You're gonna get as close. You're gonna do the best that you can because if, you don't have the money. You're not in that one percent. You mm-hmm. we don't have many in that one percent. Mm-hmm. And, and and you're not gonna have the ability, you know, we could go to civil war in this country uh-huh. and you still wouldn't have it because you're gonna have those on that side and these on this side and we're having a war. You, you understand what I'm saying? So we gotta learn to coexist to the best of our abilities. We have to uh, position our kids. Well, I ain't finna go into all that. Let me be, let let me be devil advocate. Let me finish, hold it, hold it. Thought. Right. What, what I'm saying is this, like you said it earlier, we look around on TV, we have these hundreds of thousands of white people protesting with us. And so, we have more now than we did back then fighting with us right now. Dabby. All over the world. Yeah. Okay. A lot of them have agendas, man. You got Antifa coming in here. I you know, there, there's a big there's a bigger uh theme at play here. And a lot of it, you know, that's just like I've watched a lot of the black uh, a lot of the riots. You got uh-huh. young white people and mm-hmm. all black that are uh-huh. busting out windows and tearing up stuff. And you got young black people that are walking up to them saying, don't do that. Uh-huh. They don't think we tearing up our own community. They're mm-hmm. trying to, they're trying to have dissension. You know, somebody uh-huh. is funding all of these people going to all of these yeah. cities. Yeah. But, see, but, but that's how come I'm telling you, Davin, we have to do the best that we can. But go ahead, finish your thoughts, sir. Uh, uh, go, go ahead. Oh, well, it's gonna backfire because <laughs> what, what, what they're doing oh. is not gonna work. It's not gonna work. Yes, it is. Because we got black folk following them all up and down the street. <laughs> so, so, um, hello, somebody. <laughs> so one thing, one thing that, that for me, and I think for a lot of people that really expose, um, how shallow we are as a nation and as a race, when it's something to hurt your feeling, Thor- Thurman, when the sports world went down, not, you know, that, Gay, that, that made people really look at what they prioritize in life. Mm-hmm. You couldn't watch basketball. Football mm-hmm. is on the fence. We don't know what's going to happen. Baseball, I mean, sports was like the billion dollar business. Golf. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we value these individuals and we devalue other individuals. Mm-hmm. When coronavirus came, and who had to go to work to save the country? Mm-hmm. Quote unquote essential workers. Mm-hmm. The clerks so, at Kroger. Hey, right. that was a that was a dressed up how you dress up a pig, put lipstick on them. Wasn't no essential. You the sacrifice. You the sacrificial workers. That's what it was. Mm. So, but you had they had to take a hard look at who really was the pillar of our institutions when they wouldn't give these folks fifteen dollars. A, a, a working living wage, but they pay astronomical figures for somebody to play sports, basketball, football, whatever. Mm-hmm. We got for it to happen, Davian. We got to reshift where we put our money and place our value in. I agree. I agree. Teachers can't even get the necessary supplies they need to furnish yeah. the classroom. Yeah. So we pay a million dollars to a guy to go play basketball nine months out of the year for football. So as a society, that's where we got the restructure. And then you will probably see the shift because these are the people that's hurting right now. After least the millionaires not hurt. It didn't, it didn't it should shut down for two months, didn't cost them nothing. You got people losing businesses, losing jobs, losing houses, getting evicted from their apartments. I mean, the unemployment finna run out uh, in a month back to 275. How can you live by $275? So that's when the healing gonna start. That's the cry of the people outside of the police brutality because we already know that the poor, the vulnerable, the disproportionate always be the ones that suffer in our world. Like you said earlier, 400 years that this been going on, right? That's because Mm -hmm. our culture and our society haven't ever taken care of the poor. 
They haven't taken care of these people. They throw them aside as if they don't need them. And this is the cry of the voice of the poor and the unheard right now. But corporate America is taking notice because number one, they don't want their businesses towed up. You know they place value over property than over human life. Because when Mike Vick did dog fighting, he got he went to jail. They stripped him of his livelihood just for dog fighting. So this is where they're saying that we got to address these issues and we don't want this stuff happening anymore. And I think for people in law enforcement, it got to be a wake up call that we cannot no longer go around being the judge and the jury and the executor when you're dealing with people right now, because your livelihood is going to be threatened. It's got to be a wake up call for everybody that's working in this capacity, public servants that deal with people and how you deal with them going forward, or you're going to be tried by the 12. So I think we'll get to healing. Mike, maybe it might take us longer. I hope in my lifetime that we do see it. I think that racially as a community, what you smiling for, Thurman? That Cause you we, said this is gonna hurt my feelings, but you ain't heard it yet. But well, go ahead. We, we ain't got football. We don't have football this year. <laughs> I'm cool with that. You know, cause football don't football don't rule my life. Well, you know what? I was hurt, so I ain't even fit sitting here that like I want hurt. I was, yeah. it made me have to find something really to do with myself. It, it really hurt me too, yeah. because I'm a golfer, and then we had a lot of majors like the Masters and, and all these. You know, I'm just the avid golfer. I, you know, yes. I'm gonna tell you, and, and, and to go back on back to the thing, the, the thing that hurts me is that I joined the profession over 20 some odd years ago, uh, knowing that it was a uh, an elite profession where uh, we were viewed and held in the highest of esteem, and a few individuals uh, have tainted that to a point to where is that we are now uh, in, in in an uproar in this nation. That hurt my feelings, and. Um, we just have to hold uh, each other accountable. Mm -hmm. uh, as you see, you had three officers that stood by and not one, not one uh, told this guy, hey, get off his neck, put him in the car and secure him. That hurt me. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, I would even uh, go uh, far further. It's, it seems like, um, man, even with Trayvon Martin, to this day, I cannot fathom. And I know he wasn't a police officer. But yet and still, I don't know how he got off. And and you know, a because, jury of his peers. Right, because here's the deal. When and he was in Florida, a state that got a lot that allows execution of people with the standing yeah. ground miss. Yeah, yeah, but this is common sense here. I don't I, I get every everything that y'all said. I have talked about this a hundred a hundred times, if mm -hmm. not more, but and but this just goes to my integrity. If you're wrong, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. If you're right, you're right. But mm -hmm. when the dispatcher told him to stay in your car, mm -hmm. you, that's your, that was your ground to stand on right there. If you're gonna stand your ground, and nobody, mm -hmm. she, if if you went through a gun course and you forgot mm -hmm. to stay away, she mm -hmm. reminded you. So don't act like you didn't know. Stay, mm -hmm. stay in the car. Trayvon mm -hmm. will still be with us here today. There are other cases that I could actually go through and pick, but. Sadly enough, we are at a point uh, in our in our lives right now where my daughter wants to become a police officer. And, and I'm going to tell you something. At first, years ago when she first said that, I stuck my chest out like, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm going to make sure baby girl has everything that she needs. Now, I'm scratching my head. I'm, I'm burping. I'm, 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 I'm farting because I, <clears throat> I, I don't know what to tell her. I don't want my baby girl in this stuff. I promise you I don't. Because I'm gonna tell you something, it takes it takes a lot. What what Mark didn't mention to you all, and we go through it every day. And this ain't no pity party for the police. I told y'all from we, we knew what we signed up to. We was over there uh, canvassing an area a day after. Unprovoked, unsolicited, a guy walks by us and cusses us out like dirty dogs. It was it was six, seven, and all of white and black officers. Cussed mm -hmm. us out. Told mm -hmm. us that to uh, suck his, you know what, uh, kiss my blood, do of his gang mm -hmm. sign, everything. I got it on tape right now. Mm -hmm. But this that was just one incident. This happens every day. I hear it all the time. Sometimes people say it outright like this guy does. 
and I'm not breath, but we still have to maintain that degree of professionalism and don't uh, lash out uh, either yeah. in words or in actions and contain our professional composure and do our job. That's what mm-hmm. we have to do. We have we have a, a very difficult job. And I think those people who are closest to me know that we're uh, I'm going to govern myself accordingly mm-hmm. because the thing that what what our police is our police officers and anybody else in another field, but right now since this is the hot topic, what police officers have to do is to understand this: whatever we do just doesn't negatively reflect me, but it it protect it, it negative negatively reflect reflects the entire uh, department that I'm employed by, yeah. and the entire profession as all over this particular country and all over the world, and we got to understand that. You know, mm-hmm. we got to understand. That. I don't care how how mad you are, how pissed off you are, uh, what the person says to provoke you, and I don't care if you are racist or, or not. You better govern yourself accordingly, man. I work too hard uh, to to try to make this continue this as a uh, a profession of integrity and more ethics, and uh, I just hope that everybody else uh, would do the same. And and we ain't gonna even. Right. We, I'm gonna say this last sentence, and we don't even talk about the internal conflict. Ooh. Hello, so we getting it, we we getting it inside, uh-huh. we, we getting it outside, and yeah. then we got to, we got to come home. Some of us, and we have to get it at home too. I'm gonna tell you something. It it it, it is just it's it's by the <laughs> grace of God that I ain't drinking yeah. much, yeah, more than what I'm doing now. <laughs> Smoke a little bit tighter, and all that good stuff. Because sometimes I come home and I just, I just, I, I have to decompress. I'm talking about from my own yeah. family. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, hey, and then well, internal, we have some of the worst black supervisors on earth. Mm. Internal. <laughs> the, the, I, I don't care. The okay. white, the white supervisors treat us better than the black ones. I said it. Mm. Wow. In- internally. Guess what, guess what guess what I gotta say to that? Okay, go ahead. Ouch. Ouch. Go ahead. All right. Well, that's all <laughs> I gotta say. Ouch. You have to- go ahead. Ouch. Ouch. Yeah, you- yeah, yeah. Internally. Mm. The well, black ones should be ashamed of themselves. Y'all trying to talk all night. It's almost two hours into this <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna say you know be some we're going to do some closing. Give y'all okay. one minute. Mark, okay. Mike, Thurman. <laughs> then we're going to get off this thing. We still got people <laughs> looking. It is 841. We've been on this <laughs> thing. Oh, it's 841. Oh, my yes. God. Okay. <laughs> wow. One minute. Now. One minute. One minute. Keep me on the clock. Two. Two, y'all. At, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, whether you're black or white, doesn't matter. You know, when I came on a job, it wasn't black or white, it wasn't male or female. It was about blue. But now uh, this this job, law enforcement as a whole, has become black and white. And it's it's a systemic problem. It's just not with the department that I work for. Mm-hmm. But you know, being down south, I kind of, you know, I kind of a little disagree a little bit with Devin. I, I think the supervisors go both ways. It all depends on how they see you. Okay. You know, I don't see I don't see just because you you know he's a white supervisor he's better or they treat I think a lot of times I think the 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 male blacks or excuse me the black supervisor may succumb to the pressure from above mm-hmm. instead of just judging the individual by that individual accident not whether he's like or not like on the department mm-hmm. because have, coming from the perspective of being fired. I, I came back with the attitude that I'm not going to do anything wrong. Maybe I should prove them wrong. But I found out that it didn't make a difference. What I did, they're going to see me like they see me. As long as mm-hmm. I'm comfortable with who I am, I'm good. As long as my peers respect me and the community that I serve respect mm-hmm. me, I'm good mm-hmm. with it. Mm-hmm. Do you know these folks talk about keep going? <laughs> no. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Reverend. <laughs> well, you know, I just want to say that I keep hearing, well, you know, I don't never hear police officers talk about uh, tell on other police officers and all this other kind of stuff. Whatever, they like them let, let me tell you this, people. I always say, either you ain't listening, you know, uh, 
before all of this happened, I was, I'm all, I've always been labeled as a troublemaker, you know, dude, talk too much. He tells everything, but see, but you don't want to listen to me, you know, the truth uh, hurt, Mike. I, I tell a lot. I promise you, I don't hold my tongue now and I don't hold my tongue inside the police department either. So listen and listen good. No officer that I know condones what happened up in Minnesota, none. And especially the black officers that I know, none mm -hmm. of them condone what happened in Minnesota, okay? Right. And we've been saying it all over the place. Mm -hmm. I've been, you know, you know, so, and then don't tell me about what it is to be black. Hello. Don't, don't don't do that. Right. You know. Don't, hey, I gotta go. I gotta get off of here. My wife's standing over here going, I gotta go to sleep. You loud. Right. Yeah. Don't get don't get whooped I'll, tonight. I'll, I'm trying I, I, not to. You know, she worked the hours here, so one, I'm trying one, not to. One nugget before Thurman comes up. What's that? I always tell people as a black police officer, I wasn't born with privilege. I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth, but the one I have now, I molded it and it fits well. Mm. Come on, on, Doc. Thurman? Well, I, I'm going to end this whole conversation by saying, first of all, I love each and every one of you all uh, in your likeness, in our differences of opinions, in our differences of, of what we uh, embody and what we behold. And that's what makes you who you are. Uh, those individuals who I can't see on Facebook, black, white, young, or old, uh, the Bible that I uh, study from says that I got to love my, my neighbor. And uh, like it or not, I love you. Uh, you can hate me, you can lie on me, and lie on uh, Jesus Christ and he saved the world. Made the blind see the lame walking and, 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 and a host of other things. Uh, we as a profession, we got to get together. We got to talk internally. We got to stop the systemic racism that do, that does exist. Uh, if you are that, I want you to go to the nearest mirror, take a long look at yourself, because the next person that may come to your aid and rescue may not look like you, may not have been bold in the things that you have. And I encourage those officers who ex experience racism in your uh, uh, respect for, uh, department, tell it. Flatfoot, tell it because we don't need you uh, protecting and serving, period, point blank. Because it's gotten to a point where I can't breathe. Mm -hmm. Well, and then you make it dangerous for those of us that really are trying. Mm -hmm. How come y'all didn't tell me about the shirts? Jesus. I don't have one now. I, I could have worn a shirt. Well, let me say this before we go. I, hey, I, 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 was out, I was out of breath before this, bro. Oh, I forgot. You know, they both they work been in on, homicide. They been on out, so they, they, they got up on, on this. They got Thank you. So I would like to say this. I think now it's time for people who empower and people who have privilege, it's time for you to take your knee off of people's necks. And that's literally and figuratively. Uh, give up some of your privilege, give up some of your power so you can see how it feels to be a uh, quote unquote normal person. We have a lot of work to do on both sides. The accountability uh, is within the police division and in the community. We have a lot of trauma in the community and the police we have to work with. And so I think we have a lot of work to do, but now is the time for everybody who's in power or privilege to take your knee off of the marginalized people next so this world can be a better place before they burn this goddamn country down. Because if you don't do it, that's what's going to happen. And it's going to be a mess. And so we don't want to live. We don't want to see that. But if you keep on oppressing people, in the words of Farrakhan, they're going to burn this goddamn country down. And it's going to be a shame. Because he that's warned us. He warned <laughs> hey. us. And it's true. So, hey, look, people are not going to take all this stuff no more. Those days are over with. We got a whole generation coming up. They don't give a damn about nothing. And they ain't scared. So let's try to relinquish some power and some privilege. And let's see how far that goes. And this show is dedicated to George uh, Floyd. Uh, the eight minutes and 46 seconds, we have 847, 848 now. 
and it was uh, eight minutes and 46 seconds that the knee was held down on his neck, and it was really sad to see that. But um, to all the people who uh, out here protesting and marching, hey, keep hope alive, keep marching. I am with you 100%. I love it, and I am against police brutality 110%. I don't condone it. Uh, I'm not with it. I never will be. And so thanks to guests for coming on the show. And um, hey, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. But uh, I'm not with that bullshit. So for Thurman, uh, the comments were just questions. Uh, they are on our page when we get off. You go back through them. A lot of people were saying thank you all for your service, uh, your dedication, your honesty, your transparency, your empathy to people to serve. They respect you, and they hope you do the same for them when you're out in the streets. Um, I, I, I'm gonna interrupt you real quick, so 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 they'll understand. Um, way before uh, all of these injustices was was going on, especially here recently, uh, I started my own nonprofit organization, mm -hmm. uh, and everybody knows we live in a predominantly African American community here in Memphis, mm -hmm. Tennessee. My mm -hmm. nonprofit is set up to address four different areas that keep African-American inside the criminal justice system that we call 201 properly. So I help people get their driver's license reinstated, records expunged, help them get find jobs, help them out with child support issues. Those are the, fain, the four main reasons why, the easy reasons why we stay in the criminal justice system. I didn't, need, mm -hmm. I didn't need a tragedy for me to do that. I do this on my own time. Mm -hmm. uh, I got one of my great friends that has been calling me throughout this whole Zoom, Zoom call who he always wants to wants to uh, remain anonymous, because, uh, and that's just because he's humble like that. And, but mm -hmm. he loves, and he don't look like uh, none of us on this uh, particular thing. I got a lot of friends, uh, got more money than I will ever have. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably should probably should uh, go work for him. But anyway, uh, I want to say this: it's called perfect harmony. You'll never hear about it. Any reason why you won't hear about it? Because it's good news. Bad news travel a lot faster than good news, and I try my best. To be proactive, and I think what, by coming up with perfect harmony, again? perfect harmony, okay, perfect. Perfect. perfect harmony. Mike is Mike knows about it. Uh, Mike has uh, uh, attended many of our uh, uh, gatherings where we've set up uh, and tried to uh, assist individuals in those areas. Sometimes people ask me for requests, and even though that's not listed on the on the website or the Facebook page or the uh, Instagram or Twitter account, hell, I try to do it anyway. That's just because that's in my spirit. I am a true public servant. Again, I didn't need a tragedy like this in order for me to come up with it at the last minute. I saw it. I saw what we're going through right now in the future. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why I'm doing it. And that's just to bridge the gap. The reason why I named it Perfect Harmony, A, I love music. B, I want law enforcement and the community to live together in perfect harmony. Love y'all. Peace and hair grease. So that's, I mean, that's good. And I make sure I put it out there so people can check out, you know, what you're doing. And uh, probably a lot of those guys you probably serve, I probably know them. Um, yeah. Coming through, two, uh, coming through uh, 1045, Mullen Station. So right. um, COVID-19 has slowed us down a lot. In, uh, so our down. And I it slowed us down yeah. too. And I apologize. There's a couple people I, I got to get, uh, get, I got to get to. And if you're watching here, I don't want you to talk bad about me. Look, it's just been real slow and the murders ain't slowed down either. So I do my my nonprofit <clears throat> on, on my spare time, which that's a uh, that's an oxymoron. I don't have really spare time. Uh, but there is a need for us to be better as a people. And who better than to help our people out that we protect and serve than the police? I, I agree 100 percent. I mean, that's one of the reasons that we started ours, our nonprofit. And that's one of the reasons that we have this talk show right now. Even like my brother Mike over there, that's so sleepy, he need to go to bed. So Mike his wife over out. there. Yeah, his wife got him hemp. Yeah, Mike, got Mike got have his phone. nose in the corner. I'm not sleepy, Hello. I'm just just quiet. We understand. His wife, his wife told him to hurry. Right. Look, Shut it up. I think that um we've gotten everything out that we can get out tonight. Maybe. Uh, we'll see where we are in the next month or so. And if you gentlemen are free, we'll come back and do this again. And um, race relations with the police and the community got better. Hopefully we've seen some momentum and some movement from our mayor. 
and elected officials, those that, that city council. I <laughs> see you, Mike. So uh, on behalf of myself and David and the Unleashed Voice, Mark, Mike, Thurman, it's been great. Where you see God, Jim? Hold on, let's slow Paul get his die. We thank y'all for hanging with us tonight. We out of here. It's dinner time. See y'all later. All right, God, take care. Hey, thank y'all. Thank you. Take care.